Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to examine the uh, early life and early career of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, but before we begin our lecture proper, I would simply like to do our customary recap and just touch bases on what we discussed in our last lecture. So in our last lecture, we discussed the uh, domestic front of the United States during the 1950s. Uh, we touched on the baby boom, uh, which was this um, explosion in the population uh, in the United States. And the baby boom was really sustained by and the population growth were sustained by improvements in uh, in healthcare and uh, healthcare practices. Um, the baby boom wasn't so much that more and more Americans were having babies, but more and more babies were surviving. The infant mortality rate dropped um, precipitously. Um, more and more children were surviving infancy and early childhood uh, and living on. Um, and many more Americans were living on into older into old age. Um, we also looked at the uh, the rise of suburbs. Uh, towns such as Levittown began to spring up, aided by the uh, the the growing affluence in American society, and of course uh, a lot of the um, the service members, the GIs, used uh, low inc uh, low interest uh, rates, um, uh, low interest mortgage rates to purchase homes for their families. Um, and we also looked at the, the, the conformity, this, this startling conformity um, that, that set in as uh, affluence sort of gave way to a, uh, a social ideal um, reinforced by the fact that more and more families were reliant upon single wage earners who were able to support their family and also had a lot of discretionary income to devote toward more leisurely pursuits for themselves and their families. Um, and if that happened, more and more people set into this sort of um, generality and a lot of people began to lose their individuality. And uh, with that, I'd like to dive right in for the lecture today. Uh, and we looked, uh, in the last lecture, we looked at the policies of, uh, at the forefront of the Republic um, as the Cold War began. Uh, and we're going to look at, for this lecture, uh, for, for this and um, because this is a two-part lecture, um, we're, for this lecture and the next lecture, we're going to look at uh, a couple of the Supreme Court uh, cases that swirled about. And uh, to begin with, I'd just like to catch us up on court history since we last left it. Now, our last lecture on the, on the Supreme Court concerned the, uh, the task court and the Supreme Court cases in the 1920s. And we, uh, we also addressed the, uh, the court during the court packing scheme of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and and just, to, um, just to refresh in everybody's memory, the court packing scheme was a measure designed to give Roosevelt a supermajority on the bench. Um, which would enable him to defeat his judicial adversaries, the so-called uh, four horsemen of reaction. Um, now Roosevelt defeated his judicial opponents not by the court packing scheme, but through retirement and death. Um, and he was able to uh, appoint uh, a number of justices over his 12 years in office, including nominating, uh, no nominating Harlan Fisk Stone as the Chief Justice in 1941. Now, Stone was in turn succeeded by Fred Vinson in 1946. Now, Vinson was nominated by President Truman and owed his appointment um, to his personal friendship with the president, not his legal abilities. As such, Vinson rarely disagreed with the president's position, uh, adding uh, judicial muscle to the president's stance on civil rights which caused a, a party rift in the Democratic Party in, 1940, in 1948 as Dixiecrat segregationists abandoned the party and ran uh, Strom Thurmond against Truman in 1948. Now, Vincent was a weak chief justice, by all accounts. Um, he presided over a, a torn court and a court that was besieged by threats of communism and civil rights complaints. Uh, Truman left the White House in 1953, and Chief, Johnson, uh, Chief Justice Vinson, sorry about that, also died uh, later that same year. Now, these political factors provide the backdrop for the case and cases uh, at the subject of this lecture, uh, the life and career of Thurgood Marshall, who in his own right uh, was a remarkable man, uh, a leading figure, uh, perhaps the 
most prominent legal figure during the legal phase of the civil rights movement. Between 1938 and 1961, Marshall headed the office of the NAACP's uh, Legal Defense Fund, arguing dozens of civil rights cases across the Republic and later serving on the Supreme Court from 1967 to 1991, uh, becoming the first African-American justice to sit on the Supreme Court. Now, Marshall became known as Mr. Civil Rights, a title that he richly deserved and worked tirelessly to achieve. All right, now, Thurgood Marshall was born in Baltimore, Maryland on July 2nd, 1908. Marshall inherited his name from his paternal grandfather, Thorny Good Marshall, who had been born a slave in rural Virginia. Now, over the years, with the help of speaking patterns, uh, Thorny Good became Thorough Good, which was later just shortened to Thurgood. Now, Thorny Marshall escaped from slavery as a teenager and settled in Maryland, where he opened a grocery store and raised his family. His eldest son, Willie, worked as a railroad porter in Baltimore. Now, the Marshalls became a part of the growing Baltimore African-American middle class. Marshall grew up in a household that engaged in dinnertime debates headed by his father. Um, and it, within his household, ac academic excellence was also highly encouraged. Now, Marshall later credited the dinnertime uh, table discussions with motivating him to pursue a career in law. Uh, and Marshall, uh, he attended Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, uh, which was known as the Black Princeton, where he excelled at debate and traveled to Boston, where he competed in debates against teams from other universities. He earned his tuition by waiting tables at a private dinner club, uh, a private club on, uh, on the Chesapeake, where his father was the head steward. Now, Marshall loved to tell a, a, a certain story about a senator who once yelled at him, nigger, I want service at this table, uh, during his stint as a waiter. Now, Marshall held his tongue uh, and was rewarded with a $20 tip. Um, Marshall ra uh, rationalized the treatment, uh, rationalized the treatment has, uh, has worth it. Um, uh, he said that it was worth uh, $20, that he figured it was worth $20 to be called a nigger. Uh, but he quipped the moment the senator ran out of 20s, he would bust them in the nose uh, for, for referring to him at that word. Um, uh, during, uh, during his career, Marshall would exhibit the same rationale, holding his tongue in the face of racial epithets while focusing on the task at hand, uh, which was defeating Jim Crow segregation. Now, after his graduation from Lincoln University, Marshall wanted to attend the University of Maryland's law school in Baltimore, which at the time was segregated. Uh, he wanted to attend it, but he didn't even bother to apply because he knew he would be rejected. Uh, he chose to attend instead Howard University, the all-black law school instead. Uh, at Howard, Marshall fell under the influence of the school's inspiring dean, Charles Hamilton Houston. Now, Houston had the distinction of training virtually all of the country's African-American civil rights lawyers at the time. At the time, Howard Law School was the preeminent law school, um, much the same way that Fitch University in Tennessee, their medical school were considered the preeminent medical school uh, for the HBCU, for the, for the black uh, colleges and universities. Uh, now, Houston uh, trained uh, virtually all the lawyers at the time, and he was a very close ally of the NAACP and, uh, and worked to bring Marshall in on a case involving a black man who had been uh, charged in Virginia with the murder of two white women. Now, Houston argued the case um, before an all-white jury, and his client was, uh, was found guilty of the murders, but he was spared the death penalty. Uh, and Houston and Marshall, they later celebrated it, uh, had thought they had won an acquittal. And at the time, uh, uh, in, a, in a former slave state, uh, while segregation, while open Jim Crow segregation was still being practiced, if you were able to, um, to get an uh, African-American man accused of uh, murdering two white women, if you were able to uh, spare, um, have him spared the death penalty, it was almost the equivalent of an acquittal. That was the, uh, the social... Uh, and legal environment that uh, that these men worked in. Now um, it was it was seen as a, as an amazing victory at the time for them. It was an anomaly uh, at the time because normally 
uh, the um, the man who was uh, thought to be guilty, the, the man who was charged with the crime, he would have just been hung, um, more lynched than anything. Um, so that was a remarkable feat in, in their career. And the experience uh, would have a lifelong effect on Marshall, who would go on to become a staunch opponent of capital punishment. Now, Houston steered Marshall into civil rights law, and Marshall brought his first case against the University of Maryland Law School in 1935. Now, Marshall represented a young man named Donald Murray, who had graduated from Amherst College and applied to the University of Maryland Law School, but he was denied admission. Marshall filed a suit in state court on Murray's behalf. Marshall expected to lose the case and bring an appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, he surprisingly won the case and the law school was ordered to admit Murray, a decision that was upheld by the Maryland Supreme Court. Now, two years later, Marshall moved to New York City and joined the NAACP, heading the organization's Legal, Defense, and Education Fund. At the time, this position was uh, one of little pay and overwork, but it allowed Marshall to campaign against Jim Crow laws directly. Uh, with his uh, position, Marshall embarked on a campaign that will culminate in the Brown case. But before we get to that, uh, before we get to the Brown case, um, I would like to touch on the cases that preceded it. After accepting his positions, uh, Marshall decided to try cases aimed at desegregation and graduate courses in border states. Um, and just, just to give you a sort of a breakdown on it, uh, border states, um, we're going back to the terminology of the uh, mid-19th uh, century, um, border states being uh, uh, states like Delaware, um, Maryland, Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, um, and, and so forth. The uh, the states that um, uh, that that sort of that that that, that really bordered the uh, the core states of um, uh, the, the core old slave states, uh, places like Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. Those um, states currently uh, normally referred to as the Deep South. Um, where, uh, where segregation and segregation and racial attitude were much more hardened, much more stiffened. Um, uh, the border states still practice segregation, of course, racial segregation, Jim Crow segregation, but they, um, but it, it wasn't as entrenched in all locations the way it was in those uh, deeper South states, in the, in the states of Deep South. Um, so yeah, so uh, Marshall, his plan was to um, was to combat Jim Crow in border states, uh, and it was deemed too risky to go after the public schools in the in the core states of the Southeast. It would just be a very violent episode at at uh, at, at the very least, and just a dismal court venture at uh, at, at best. Um, now, uh, judicial orders to integrate or admit African Americans in schools in these states were less likely to offend and lead to violent reactions from segregationists, it was, uh, it was believed. And also, if, if uh, successful, this campaign would lead to a set of legal precedents that would come in handy when attempted to desegregate in the core southeastern states, um, the real bastion of uh, Jim Crow segregation. Now, Marshall won his first great victory against the state of Missouri, uh, which had no separate law school for African Americans and was the perfect target for Marshall. The NAACP lawyer found Lloyd Gaines, who had applied to the state law school uh, and was turned down due to his ethnicity. A, a suit was filed on Gaines's behalf in state court against the university's registrar, SW Canada. In an interesting twist, Missouri officials offered to pay uh, Gaines' tuition at a law school in any other state. Uh, but Gaines stood firm and he demanded admission in the state school. Now, the Missouri State Court ruled against Gaines, uh, relying on the Plessy ruling for precedent, and the U.S. Supreme Court decided to accept Gaines' appeal. Now, Houston argued the case before the Supreme Court with Marshall at his side. Chief Justice uh, Hughes, Charles Evan Hughes was the Chief Justice at the time, 
uh, and he wrote for the court in the case of Gaines v. Canada that Missouri could not give European Americans an education and deny African Americans that same education. Hughes went on to say that the states could provide equal facilities in separate schools without violating the constitutions. Now, Missouri lawmakers promptly established a separate law school at Lincoln University, the state's all uh, African American college. Now, the NAACP planned a second suit arguing that the separate law school was unequal in quality to the state's official school. Now, the, the second lawsuit was never filed, however, because Lloyd Gaines had taken the funds raised by the NAACP for his uh, tuition and simply disappeared from sight. Now, the precedent of the Gaines case stood, though, and it echoed across the Republic that states could not bar African Americans from graduate schools without providing them an alternative, equal facility within the state. And at this, we will break and we will come back with part two of our lecture on Thurgood Marshall. And as always, I'm Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture. Uh, really, I'm really trying not to say too much. Thurgood Marshall is a personal hero of mine. Um, really, uh, his career, his attitude towards uh, equality really inspired me when I was younger and it continues to inspire me uh, as an adult. Um, so hit like, subscribe, comment, let me know what you thought about the case, let me know what you thought about um, Thurgood Marshall's early career so far. And as always, hit like, subscribe, and comment, and I will see you guys next time for another lecture.